Last week we talked about, you know, pain, problems, the trials of life out of James 1, 1 through 8. And I spent a lot of time in 1 through 4 uh, when, when really <clears throat> it encompasses a, a, a lot when we talk about consider it all joy. Right there off the bat, consider it all joy. And then you, I, I catch you off guard because, we, yeah, consider it all joy, but what? And then it goes, oh, but consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, those temptations, those problems, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And it says, and let that endurance, that testing of your faith, let that endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing. So tonight as we look about uh, James 1, 19 through 27, that's where we're going to be tonight, James 1, 19 through 27. We're going to talk about real faith, real faith leading to change. Real faith, true faith leads to change. So let's look in James 1, 19 through 27. But before we get there, let me just read a couple of things about real faith and Real faith means real obedience. Lots of people consider themselves spiritual, but not nearly as many approach God's word with a commitment to obedience. Many have faith, but without works. In other words, they believe things about God, but they are not changed by what they believe. The research is disheartening. People who consider themselves Christians aren't noticeably different in their actions than people who don't. Think how many people go to church week in and week out. Listen to numerous sermons about what God commands them to do. Feed the poor, be sexually pure, treat others with respect and love, and give generously to God and to those in need, and then say, that was a great message today. I really needed to hear that. And then we go home, wake up the next morning, and we have not changed a thing. And go through our week and still have not changed a thing. It's easy to look into God's word and to hear it and instantly forget it or set it aside. In staff meeting yesterday, it, it, here's a great example. We were joking about something and I think Brian was going through one of our, our CBT lessons and he asked, he said, what was the pastor's points uh, Sunday? Crickets. I said, we were in Luke. I got that right. But we can remember the past point. Well, well, what an example. We at least could get where we were, but we did not even know the points. And it's something, and we all probably took notes. I know I did. If I had my Bible with me, I would have opened it up. And I said, I would have gone through them all. I had them all right there in my notes, you know. But many times we just do that and go through the motions. And we don't allow that to apply to change us in our life. So this leads us only to be informed, but not transformed. We don't apply what we are hearing. We all know someone who says they believe something strongly, but their actions don't match their belief. You know somebody like that? Have you ever run across somebody that, that believes something so strongly, but yet they don't, their actions don't mimic that? How does that make you feel? We use the terms like, you know, fake, phony, uh, a bogus, right? Well, the Bible has a specific word for that. It's called hypocrisy. The book of James tells us to be people who obey God instead of just listening to what he says and agreeing with him. Simple, yes, but it is challenging for us to be doers of what God says and not just hearers alone. Tonight's study is going to help us move forward to a changed life Last week, I referred to the book of James as Christianity and blue jeans. Comes from my friend James. I told you that last week. I'm saying that he just tells it like it is. Simple, basic, black and white truth from the word of God. In other words, actions speak louder than words. Pretty much sums up what James is telling us. So let's look at James 1, verse 19 through 21, as we move toward the end of the chapter. This you know, my beloved brethren. But everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. 
Therefore, put aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness in humility. Receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. I probably lost some of us when I said be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Because that's going to hit us all hard at some point if we're not already there. Point number one, God expects us to act on what we know. Jesus in, Jesus out principle, right? The word of God in, the word of God being fleshed out. In other words, we must be receptive to God's word. So sub point number one is quick to hear in verse 19 in the first part. When someone is quick to hear, it means they are willingly, carefully desiring to listen and to analyze what's being said. In other words, bend an ear that you might hear. We, I, I say that in prayer to the Lord that he would, I would get his attention. Sometimes my wife says, are you listening? I know you hear me, but are you listening? There is a difference, man. Amen? Listen. B move in. It's urgent we continue in the word of truth as stated in verse 18. I'll back up just a, one verse. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. This is written so we might see things that happen to us in their proper perspective, from a biblical perspective. How many times have we gone through trials and sufferings and pain and, and done it through a human perspective? How did that turn out for you? Not well. I guarantee you, not well. Because we're, then we're, we find ourselves dependent upon ourselves somehow to pick ourselves up. And we, we can't do that continually through trials and, and, and temptations or whatever without failing. We can only do that for so long. But if we look at things with a biblical perspective according to his word, guess what? It changes the whole heart of things. And then we can begin to look at things and consider it all joy. And for whatever reason, God, what are you wanting to teach me through this difficulty, this trial? Why this temptation? Consider it all joy, not if you encounter, right? We, we, we talked about that last week. It's not if, but when you encounter various trials. From a biblical perspective, not out of our flesh. Romans 10, 17 confirms this truth when it says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We're to be, it says, eager listeners, hearers, listening for the Spirit's voice. The message of God requires an attentive ear and a heartfelt response. An attentive ear and a heartfelt response. Matthew eleven five 5 says, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. In Revelation 2 and 3, James told the church, churches of Asia Minor six times, to hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. In other words, he wanted them to hear what God had to say. Christianity is a relationship rather than a religion in which a spectator cannot survive, but must participate in by living and abiding in his word. And that abiding we talked about last week was to abide, to come under, to come under the authority of Scripture. Man, so let that be the ruling and guiding uh, uh, word in your life, the rule, the gauge by which we live. There's a beautiful illustration of this truth in the life of King David in 2 Samuel 23, 14 through 17. David's hiding from the Phil Philistines who were in possession of Bethlehem at the time. He yearned for a drink of cool water from the well of Bethlehem. That well he had visited many times as a child, he did not issue an order to his men. He simply said to himself, Oh, that one would give me a drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. Three of his mighty men, they heard the king sigh for water, risked their lives to secure that water and bring King David a drink. They were swift to hear. If we are quick to hear, that means we will be also slow to speak. Not only are we to be quick to hear, but we 
are to be slow to speak, to develop a controlled tongue. In other words, by having listening ears and practicing patience, our ability to control the tongue will also be disciplined. Being slow to speak does not mean to remain silent. It just means to listen more and to talk less. I know I've heard it many times. That's why God gave us what? Two ears, one mouth. Proverbs 10, 19 says, He who restrains his lips is wise. Psalm 141, verse 3 says, Take control of what I say, O Lord, and guard my lips. Think of Jesus when he disciples uh, asked when the disciples asked him a question. Jesus would respond back with a question. He made them think. He made them talk less, but made them listen more. When we are quick to hear and slow to speak, we are more apt to be also slow to anger. We must develop a calm demeanor. In verse 19, the latter part in verse 20, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Now, anger is an emotion that for many of us is very, very, very hard to control. However, with the help of the Holy Spirit, just like I believe anything that we struggle with, we can overcome. We can practice the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. And as James clearly states, the anger of a man does not achieve the righteousness of God. While it is possible to be angry at certain sins, to be angry by fighting for justice, and maybe even to seek honor on someone's behalf. This type of anger, though, is self-controlled and channeled to the property, proper authorities. James, though, is talking about a type of anger that is uncontrollable and unwise. This kind of obedience to his word, though, it takes much humility. <clears throat> much grace, and, and, and no doubt much forgiveness, all of which you and I have abundantly received. Amen? God calls us to put away filthiness and wickedness in verse 21 and receive his word that is, he says is implanted, which is able to save our soul. Our mission statement in our church is we exist to glorify God. By the, how do we glorify God? By surrendering to him, to everything in his words, his precepts, everything that we, we read and we, we are part of, and then to the growth of his kingdom. Our actions affect the very lives of those around us and our witness for God's kingdom. Amen? Remember, our core values here at this church, Bible-anchored, Christ-centered, discipleship-driven, and unity-focused. This is where the book of James hits us where we need it the most. Now that we are hearers of the word, what are we to do with it? Once it is implanted within us, we are not just to sit and soak, but we are to become point number two, to be doers of the word. We're to put that which we know now, put into action. Put feet to action for the glory of God. In verse 22 through 25, it says, But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves, in other words, to mislead or trick, or to believe something that is not true. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man looking at his natural face in the mirror, for once he has looked at himself and gone away, his, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. We must be moved by his word into action. But he who looks intently at the perfect law, and let me, but he who looks intently, notice that he is not simply talking about someone who merely looks at God's word. He is talking about someone who looks intently. And I, and I found an article that talked about this. It is the word look means to stoop down and gaze into in the Greek. 
It is the same words that was used to denote the way Peter, John, and Mary stooped down to look into the empty tomb on Resurrection Day. Aren't you thankful, grateful, and blessed because the tomb is empty? Amen? So, but he who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, it says, and abides by it, again, coming under it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Psalm 119, 11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Faith is demonstrated by our actions. Doers of the word are God uh, of God are doers of the will of God. It is not the hearing but the doing that brings us such blessing. The law is to set us free from our sinful nature. And when we follow God's law and obey it, it says that we will. It says that we will be blessed. That means if you have faith but not works, you are deceiving your, your, yourself and that your faith is not genuine. The Bible makes it clear that we are deceived when we hear and we refuse to act on what we know instead of taking action on what we have heard. If we choose to act on what we hear from God's word, the result is all a part of that sanctification process. It is the process of being come, becoming more like Christ and responding more like him in our trials and in our daily living. Our Heavenly Father desires that we become doers of the word and not just hearers only. Amen? This is a demonstration of God's character in our life, which will be expressed through compassion and caring for others. Let's bring this to a close as we look to verse 26 and 27. I'll be like Curtis's preaching tonight. I don't mean that we're going to land the plane yet. I just mean we're going to be circling for a few minutes. All right, well, let's, let's look in the mirror. As I said, not one that reflects, but the mirror of his word, the one which reveals our heart. And in point number three, profession without possession. In other words, we must submit to God's word. Verse 26 and 27. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Subpoint number one, man, an unbridled tongue. Have you ever been around someone with an unbridled tongue? What I like about James is he just tells it like it is. He doesn't get all technical. He doesn't get all philosophical as some others do. There's no debating what James is trying to express here. Basically, if you say you love God, but you don't practice self-control, your religion is worthless. That's what James is telling us. Don't, I'm just the messenger. That's what his word says. You are just deceiving your own heart, and everyone around you will notice it. Even unbelievers can tell the difference between genuine Christians and those pretending to be followers. Amen? Listen, they know. Why do you think they, 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 want, they don't want to come to church? Because they said they're full of hypocrites. Well, they're absolutely right. They can jump join us as well. But... We need to have a better outward look to those who don't know him. They ought to be able to see him in us. I'm a total believer, yes, in the gospel, which is professed, but I also believe a greater witness has come by, by watching, by seeing. How you respond to the very thing we talked about. Is your joy there when you're facing that trial and that temptation? How are you responding? Because I've said it many times, people are watching you. People are watching us and how we respond to the things of the government, how we talk about our president, how we talk about our government, how we talk about local issues, how we talk about our family, how we talk about our job, how we talk about our families. Hmm. 
If you want to evangelize both by words or by actions and help bring people to the knowledge of the truth about who God is, we need to bridle the tongue. You can tell a lot about a person by their tongue. A person does not build a reputation by what he knows or by what he says, but by what he does. It is the tongue, though, that reveals the very heart of that person. Let me get my Bible real quick. Let me read a scripture out of here. Matthew 12. Matthew 12, 33 through 37. This is a bonus. Words reveal character. That's the title. Words reveal character. Matthew 12, 33 through 37. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So we should take what we say and in a bridal tongue, and should take this very seriously. Because if the heart is right, your speech will be right. Amen? The tongue is connected to the heart. A controlled tongue means a controlled body. James 3 and 2 says, For in many things we all stumble. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle his whole body. Wow. I'm going to read that again. James 3, 2. For in many things we all stumble. If any man offend not in word. In other words, bridles his tongue. It says the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Satan can use the tongue to destroy lives. With a word, a heart is lifted up or cast down. With a word, our spirits are dashed or they are lifted up and encouraged. It can either be sweetness to the, to the ears or it can be bitterness to the heart. It can, it can give victory. It can uplift, but it can also tear down and defeat as well. False religion is characterized by a loose tongue and is always insecure and unreal. Let's look at subpoint number two, the works of faith. Verse 27, we are to take the blessings of God to those who are in need. 1 John 3, 17 and 18. 1 John 3, 17 and 18 says, But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, and closes his heart against him, how does he love God? And how does the love of God abide in him? Verse 18, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. Listen, people matter to God. Amen? People matter to God. So do they matter to you and I? Do people matter? matter to you and I. James is referring to a religion that is clean and uncorrupted, one that is inwardly and outwardly the same. This text reminds us that Christianity, I, I, I like the word Christianity over the word religion so many times that, that he's using here, but, but it is, it reminds us that Christianity is marked by personal ministry by responding to the authentic needs of others with the love of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, people do not care how much you know. And again, all this can come into here until they know how much you care. That requires something, does it not? That requires not only to hear that, that, that there's a problem, not only to see that there's a need, but it's also to put foot to action then. That's when your love really is revealed. 
People don't know, care how much you know until they know how much you care. And we can do that inwardly and outwardly, all in the same. This text reminds us all the way through here that the love of Jesus Christ can only be provided through us by the power of the Holy Spirit. So in the end, love doesn't just keep thinking about it or planning for it. It simply put, love does. In other words, that is active. Love is active. So James concerned himself with our treatment of others and our testimony before others. So as we come to a close tonight, would you bow your heads with me? Would you close your eyes? I hope this chapter tonight in James has challenged many of you, convicted some of you, but encouraged all of you. As James has given us the impression of a person who has had such careful gaze upon what he has seen in his mirror that he has become a doer of the word and is enjoying the blessings promised to him. A final quote from Major Ian Thomas, when asked for advice from a young Christian, replied, If you make it your aim to always please Christ, everything else will take care of itself. So, Father, would this be our prayer tonight? Would this be our desire to please you in all things? Lord, turn our eyes from the worthless things of this world and give us life, abundant life, through your word. Father, I ask that you would allow us, Lord, greater insight into your word, that we might apply it, that we might practice it. Lord, whatever you are telling us tonight, Lord, would we be active in serving you the way we should. Lord, if it is that we need to calm down, Father, would you bring that to our heart? Lord, if it is our patience, Lord, we know that to, to ask that you would calm our nerves, uh, to help me in patience, Lord, you're going to provide the very things that I struggle with so that I can show patience. So, Father, when we ask it, we know that it's coming. And if it's anger in our life, Father, would we be committed today to get a handle on it? Father, I thank you, Lord, for tonight. I thank you, Lord, for those that are here. For those that are hearing the word, I pray that, God, we would leave here changed and becoming doers of the word, applying that which we hear tonight. Lord, would it bring all glory, honor, and praise to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, look, look at the clock, y'all, 715. Somebody better shout amen. <laughs> Last week, there were kids running by. The preacher has already been done by 15 minutes. They laughed at me, but that's all right. Last week was a good week. You know that, uh, Mike, that, that last scripture right there, not that scripture, but that uh, Major Ian Thomas quote, that's something that could be used probably as a quote for Archery, if you make it your aim to always please Christ, everything else will take care of itself. Man, that's pretty neat. I thought about you when I read that. I thought about y'all. Mm.